Every week we do a Q&A with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community to find how they persevered, how they innovated, how they built communities, and how they found solutions. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast, where we talk with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community. This woman most assuredly qualifies. Trisha Zorn won 55 medals in Paralympic swimming, 55 medals. I said to her before we got on that I was a little bit disappointed that she didn't double Michael Phelps's Hall of 28, but she won 55 medals over seven games. She is a phenomenal athlete who has done so much for the sport. We're looking forward to talking to her. Trisha, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Chris. I hope it's okay that I told people that I was disappointed that you didn't double Michael. (laughs) That'd be awesome though. (laughs) Well, maybe you can come out of retirement and win one more. That is not in the in the cards for me. <laughs> so your first games was 1980. And, and and I mean this is kind of interesting, right? So you were you were the first visually impaired athlete to be an all-American in college, but you'd already gone to two Paralympic games before you went to college. Is that right? Yes. Um when I um when I, my first Paralympic Games was in 1980, and um, uh, I w- went, then went to college in 1982 when I graduated from high school. And um, I was the first, as you stated, I was the first uh, physically disabled athlete to earn a full athletic scholarship to a Division I uh, university. So um, I had competed in one games. And then when I was in college, I had competed in my second Paralympic games. Oh, you did. Okay. Because what I had read is that you were in college from 84 to 87. Is that not right? It was 82. 82. Yeah. Ah, no, I apologize about that. Now, how did this work when you were growing up? Because did you didn't did you know about the Paralympics when you were first starting out? Or did you just go into swimming? Or how did that work? Yeah, no, um, actually, I had no idea about what the Paralympics were or what it what it what that entailed. Um, And I was just doing my thing. And, um, you know, being born and raised in Southern California and going to the beach and um, every summer. And then we decided they were starting a swim team in our local community. And um, we had asked my sister and I both had asked my parents to, you know, if we could go over and join and which we did. Um, and, um, at that point, my swimming career started and, you know, I was just learning the basic strokes, um, of competitive swimming at that time. And then, um, once I got, I think, I believe it was probably when I was at 10 years old, um, one of the coaches from Mission Viejo. Um, had contacted my parents and asked if I could come um, and down uh, to their team uh, to swim. And so I, we transferred down and moved down to Mission Viejo and um, my swimming career took off from there. And um, from a swim meet, uh, there was an article that was written about me and then a um, gentleman called Dr. Charles Buell. He was a big proponent of the Paralympic Games and the United States Association of Blind Athletes in California. And he uh, reached out to me and he, um, you know, shared what the Paralympics were. And um, from that point forward, I, you know, got involved with the Paralympic movement. The swimming, was swimming a sport? I mean, in some ways, as a visually impaired athlete, Swimming is a sport that kind of levels the playing field. I and mean, there, there's that famous race with Michael Phelps where his goggles, uh, where his goggles cracked, right? And he couldn't couldn't see, but had all of his strokes all mapped out and everything and counted out so he knew where he was when he was supposed to be there and everything. I would imagine it was different than playing soccer, playing softball, those kinds of things. Did you take to swimming because it was something that you could actually physically sort of be good at, I would imagine. Yeah, I think, I mean, there are challenges and there were challenges, you know, of course, I think with any sport that you, you know, get involved with and, and go along with for the ride, but swimming to me, 
Um, personally, it was something that I felt free for. Um, and I felt free in the water um, because I wasn't able, I didn't have to focus on, you know, a ball coming or being hit by a ball or anything like that. Um, you know, so um, uh, you had to adapt. And as you know, you know, you just adapt what works for you. And for me, when it came to swimming, I, you know, I felt that I just had to count my strokes from whatever pool I was in from one end of the pool to the other, or it depended on, you know, where I was in the pool, if it was an indoor pool or an outdoor pool, because in an outdoor pool, you know, if there's a bright sunlight, that was really hard for me because of my eye condition. Mm -hmm. So um, I needed to make sure and take extra steps to know exactly where I was in the pool and how I was going to, you know, see the wall and make my turns to be efficient. So you really, but you, I'd imagine it's like full speed ahead, right? So you're looking at this, this is the full first time in some ways that you can be full speed ahead because if you're counting your strokes, you know where you are in the pool, you know that you'll get to the wall, you have to do your flip turn or whatever, maybe you're, you're young enough that you're not doing flip turns in the, in the beginning, but was it really that sense of being full speed ahead as opposed to kind of the rest of your life where you didn't necessarily, where it's almost like you could control the environment. Does that make sense more than everything yeah, else? Yeah, I think it does make sense. And I think it, I did control my environment because I was able to know where I was. And I had, you know, as you know, every senses take over. So I had a sense of my my body awareness of in the pool. Um, I knew I could feel where other people, my competitors were in the pool, even though I may not been able to see them. Um, so maybe to me, uh, you know, I looked at, at, at a point of uh, sometimes that maybe that was an advantage um, because I didn't have that distraction of trying to look to see where my co competition was. Um, you know, so I had that sense of knowing where I was in my body, um, sense of body awareness and knowing what I needed to do in order to, you know, um, reach the goals that I wanted to reach. Were you good right away? I think I was, I, I mean, when I first started swimming, of uh, course, like I said earlier, you know, we would go to the beach and we would swim in the water. So I had that strength and I had that sense of, I like doing what, you know, swimming entailed to do. Um, so I think the one thing that set me aside um, outside of my um, disability was that was my competitiveness. Mm -hmm. um, because if somebody had said to me, oh, you're not, you know, you're not able to do that because, you know, you have the lack of the vision, um, you know, that would just um, put a flame under me um, and just motivate me more to overachieve and be an overachiever. But then again, be, you know, a perfectionist in, in the, in the same, at the same time. Because if Mission Viejo is calling you or sending a letter to your parents when you're 10 years old, Mission Viejo was was swimming really at that time, right? So, so that means that there was some promise that they saw something in you. Yeah, and I think so, you know, and I think that's probably part of it. And to be able to be with a community of um, of, of swimmers who had the same output and the same goals that you had to, you know, whether it be, you know, to at that young age, you know, whether to be on, you know, a national, you know, record relay or to be, you know, to make junior nationals or to make senior nationals or to make the world championship team. Um, you know, you all had a sense of the same goals and to be able to be immersed in that environment um, was just something else that you couldn't, you know, ask in a better environment to be a part of. That to me is one of the things that in some ways is so important is this sense of being able to visualize, no pun intended here, I apologize, but uh, the, the, 
like the people who can get to that top of the world. You know, you're talking about junior nationals, senior nationals, world championships, Olympics, Paralympics, these kinds of things. Those are the people who are in the pool with you. Those are the people who who are kind of who are your friends. And and, and so it doesn't seem like it seems like there can be that separation between between your life and those people on television. But those people on television were the people who were in the pool with you. Did that make you realize that you could get to the top of the world? Yeah, I think that, you know, you look up to, obviously, you don't have, I wasn't, when I was growing up, I didn't really have a role model outside of, you know, my, my, my parents, obviously, you know, I looked up to and, you know, they were very supportive and my family was, but really I, you know, I had my role models when I was growing up was, you know, always those people that we, you know, that you, that the, the old group that was in front of you, um, as we talked about, you know, um, Jennifer Hooker, Shirley Babishoff, you know, Kim Payton, all those girls that, you know, were, um, and Brian Goodell. So all of those athletes that you, that swam in the same pool with you, not with you, but in a different group, but still they were there and they were making, you know, they were doing their thing. And to be able to know that I can possibly be one of them at, when I got to that age was something that inspired me to continually go and each day to practice. And you were just separated by a lane line effectively, right? So the, the faster group is in one lane and then you're in a different lane and somebody else is in different. Lane. That's how it works, right? Where you have. Yeah. You have different lanes and depending on what group you're in, whether you were in the sprint group, the middle distance group or a distance group. When did you, so with the Paralympic side, you, you, you were talking about Dr. Buell, but did you go the Olympic route as well? Like, did you go to trials and those kinds of things? I went to the 1980 Olympic trials. Um, and I missed the Olympic team by one one hundredth of a second in the tuner back. Um, and that kind of was a stepping stone for me. Um, you know, when you're 16 and, you know, that was your life goal to make the Olympic team and then you don't. And of course, that was the year that they boycotted. So they weren't going to go anyways. But um that's when I made the decision to go. They went ahead and had the Paralympic Games in Arnhem Holland in 1980. And so I thought that I wanted to be a part of that and just to have that experience and know what it was all about. Um, you know, being so young at that time and not knowing what the Paralympics were. Well, it was a bit of a different time. I mean, obviously you get swimmers who are who are still young and are really competitive but it also at that time you'd cycle out of the sport by the time you finished college really I mean like if you're 22 you were old yeah, back yeah. then right oh yes it was a it was a different world so so one 100th one 100th means that you were fourth place by one 100th of a second right correct Yes. So that means you didn't go to the games, which means that you didn't do the 200 meter back, which means that you wouldn't have, because you probably would have been, you know, might, might have been able to swim on a relay or whatever, even in some heats or something like that. So you would have had a good opportunity to win some medals at those games. And, and also just in that you're talking about the boycott, the Paralympics did not end up following the Olympics of the same city and the same venues until Seoul in 1988. Correct. So, yes. so prior to that, they were in different places. So you were, so, so when you went to Arnhem, how did things go? Like, and how did things go? But also, how did you feel about this? You just missed making the Olympic team. Did you go to the Paralympics going, I, I'm ready to go beat up on some people now? Yeah, I think it was something. I think that was part of it. Um, but again, at 16, you know, you're in a different mindset and you're different. You know, uh, I, I think um, you don't appreciate, um, you know, what 
the accomplishments that you do do or that you did have at that age if you you know that you do when you're older in a sport um and so when I went to the games again I did you know it was all new I didn't know anything I didn't know what to you know what to expect um and so I had a very good games um you know my times were um very good um, and so um, during the games in Holland, I was able to get, um, I swam seven events and I had seven gold medals and set seven world records. Yes, I think your answer was that you went and beat up on people. <laughs> so 100 meter backstroke, which was your event. Yes. Right, or, or really 200 was, was yeah. more of your event, but uh, then 100 meter butterfly, then 100 meter freestyle, 200 meter IM, which is all four events, uh, uh, backstroke, breaststroke, butterfly, and freestyle, and then 400 IM, which is just a longer version of that, 400, uh, four, four by 100 free, free relay, so freestyle relay, four by 100 medley relay. Yes. <laughs> so, so this is, this was pretty amazing. And you said your times were pretty good. What were your times like? I mean, because you said that you weren't distracted by other athletes and swimmers talk about you're putting money in the bank, right? When you're training, you're putting all that money in the bank and then you go and you shave and you taper and you feel like a superhero, right? And so this is, did you feel like a superhero and did you, you broke the world records, but were you swimming the times that you were swimming before did you swim pbs as well um i didn't swim pbs i don't believe i'm trying to remember but i don't believe i did um and i think it was because it was a different type of um a different time in the season um you know when when we had tapered for the and rested for the trials you know it was in the early summer and then the games, um, Paralympic games were, you know, in course in late September, October. So we were more into the training, a different training cycle. So it was a little bit difficult to try and, um, you know, gear, you know, get back up into training, some type of training, and then try and rest and taper again. So, um, I just kind of, we just kind of, um, you know, my coach and I, we just kind of tried to do the best that we could at that time and um, kind of went with it. So, um, and again, I think, you know, age wise, uh, it was, you know, I was young enough. So, you know, you just get in there and just swim, uh, you know, and not really do, do, yeah, not really think about it, you know, not let your, your head get in the game. What was it like? Cause then you went from 16 to then you were 20 at your next games. And, and this is this is interesting because you went, you went seven games total. So you went from 16 to 20. <laughs> and, and, and you gained a couple more years by the time you competed in Athens. <laughs> yeah, that might have been there might have been a four starting that. Yeah, uh, that would, yeah, it was. Yeah, so you got into the 40s. What was it like? Because because you had all this success right away. And then you went to the next games and you were competing in college when you went to the next game. So competing division one, you were at Nebraska, right? Yes. And, and so you, you were then with some tremendous athletes on a daily basis. Yes. What was it like to go to the Paralympics? And what did you see? from game to game, you know, did, was there a big improvement in terms of your competition as well? Yes. So from my first games to my second games, it was, it was, it was, um, I would say it was a maturity um, difference and also um, going from uh, like a age group training to college. Um, after my freshman year, I had um, I, I had gotten sick. Um, and so I was out for a C I was out for, uh, several months, um, with, um, mono. And so I wasn't able to train, uh, and that kind of got to me mentally. Um, and so my second, so I redshirted and then coming back and then I just, um, when I 
to prepare to the games, um, the 84 games were in New York and uh, they, they were okay since, you know, the most, a lot of the European countries didn't come over because they were kind of boycotting the games since, you know, we had boycotted the games um, in 80. So um, the Paralympics, they, the competition wasn't as strong there. Uh, so, um, and then with being sick and having a season of trying to get back and um, mentally, it was just a very challenging games for me. Um, and, um, you know, it, that, that was the point in my career when I, you know, when athletes second guess and they say, well, is this really worth what I really want to do? Um, and I really had to have some deep conversations, not just with me, with my coaches and with my family to say, you know, do I want to continue doing the sport? Um, and, you know, I finally, um, after, you know, going and talking to a sports psych, you know, psychologist and um, talking to my family, I, I realized that I did love the sport and um, that I can't expect to do good things every time I get in the water. So um, it was a learning game from a mental standpoint um, between those two games and even after. Well, you still won six gold medals. So, so it, was, it wasn't, in terms of the haul, it wasn't, it wasn't awful. But at the same time, was the clock kicking? I mean, like swimming at that point, you swam through college. That was it. Did you feel, even though you might have and you did have a longer future in the Paralympics, it, it seems so much more ephemeral, right? It seems like you just have this moment in time that, okay, I'm going to go to college and then I'm going to be a grown up and go get a job and start a family and do what grown ups do, right? So, was that part, the emotional part, was that playing into? whether the sport was important to you, whether you could, you know, you couldn't at that time, you couldn't make a living doing it. You, you weren't even getting a stipend to do it. You're probably paying to go to a lot of these events. Yeah, I think so. I think you're, you're pretty spot on on that. And um, when I was, you know, I think going through, you know, swimming at the co collegiate level, of course, it's a lot different in, in any sport competing at the collegiate level is a lot different than an age group program or amateur program. And, um, you know, the seasons are different and it's a different environment. And, you know, you, um, like you said, you, you know, after college, it's like, it was time to get quote, a real job or decide to go back, you know, to continue my education, which for me, um, that's what I did. Um, I, you know, I decided that, you know, after swimming in college, I wanted to you know, continue my education. And so, um, but I also wanted to continue to swim. So um, my, I decided to, um, uh, my college coach at the time, knew a coach here in Indiana. And that's how I came to Indiana was because of the swimming and a team that I was recommended of a coach. And so I came for the summer and uh, one, my senior year, actually, in college, I came for the summer and I trained with that, this team and um, at that time and um, just fell back in love with the sport again. So then you ended up doing grad school and continuing to swim. Yes. And so that's what what was the difference between swimming in the Paralympics and swimming in college, I mean, there must have been so many differences, I would imagine, but probably some similarities too. Very much. There's very there's a lot of similarities. I mean, obviously, um, swimming collegiately, it's more of a team environment. Yes, you're on a team. Um, you know, when you're swimming, let's say when we were when I was swimming in age group and swimming out at Michigan, it's it, but it's still an individual sport. You know, it's you're on a team, but it's still an individual sport. But for in collegiate swimming, you're swimming for points strictly for your team. Um, and so um, it's a more of, a, I think, a tighter niche 
um, of a group. And so I think it, it becomes more of a family um, environment, you know, and um, because also, you know, you, you're obviously getting your education and you're trying, you know, you're taking that next step for your, the rest of your life and whatever career, you know, people had chosen to, to pursue. So um, it was, there's a lot of similarities, but also um, one of the big differences in Paralympic swimming is, you know, Paralympic swimming, I mean, obviously it, it has always been, uh, I feel that, you know, we Paralympic athletes have a platform and that platform is, you know, to, to show those individuals, whether you're physically disabled or not, um, that, you know, that what we are capable of doing and able to do without, and only maybe have, you know, small adaptations, but um, we all have that, that drive and sense of want to show that accomplishment to the world. And you come to in the Paralympic Games with all those different countries and you all, it's, it's just very impactful of knowing that you may not be able to speak a, you know, a certain language, but you all have that common goal and that common mission once you're there at those games. How much of that were you doing on your college team, those two, right? Because you were the only representative, the only Paralympic representative on your college team. And you guys spent a lot of time together. It might not have been a lot of time talking since you were in the pool most of the time, but you're swimming two a days. You're swimming, I mean, just meters after meters. I mean, miles and miles and miles. I mean, swimming is a sport where, you, you spend a lot, a lot of time. Training. Yeah, you do. What was the, what was the message that you were saying? Because you were effectively like a Paralympic representative to your college team. And what was the interaction like with them? What did they get? Um, I, well, I think that it was one, I think it was a great learning experience, not just for me, um, but it was a learning experience for not just my coaches, that you know were at Nebraska at the time, but also the at student athletes that were in the pool with me every day. Um, you know, some of them had never been around somebody with a physical disability or even a visual impairment. Um, you know, so to be able to, you know, help and to know, you know, during practice, you know, because I wasn't able to see, let's say, the pace clock or, you know, to go when we're doing interval training and, you know, when to, you know, leave, you know, and to go and, you know, they would be a part of that and they would, you know, tell me, okay, go or whatever, um, you know, and then from a coaching standpoint, you know, was the coaches that had never had to, um, you know, make certain adaptations, um, whether it be minimal or not, but it was a learning experience for them too. So, um, I think that was one of the big takeaways was, um, you know, they, Nebraska, you know, they um, were willing to take the risk um, and um, giving me that opportunity to, to be a part of their program. And one of the other things um, is that they did support their student athletes. And second, they also had a great um, disabled student services, um, which to me, even though I was on a scholarship and that was like a job, you know, when you're in college, but my education was first. And that's what one of the reasons why I chose Nebraska too. Well, it's, it's sort of it's a swimming thing. It's like the buddy system in some ways. It sounded like you're you're talking about you had your buddy who was saying okay the the clock's coming up to 15 or whatever it is like we're on on the 15 like let's go and, and that is that is really cool just to see how the group ends up working together did you feel like when you got to the all-american point is that paying the school back for the risk that they took in bringing you onto campus and, and also having a scholarship, right? The, the investment that they made in you. 
Yeah, and I think that's so true. And I think in, in to anything, I think, you know, just even the medals that I've won, um, you know, in over the period of my career, you know, I don't, I think medals, and I've always said this, you know, me gold medals are great. And, you know, medals are wonderful to have, and they're, and they show what your accomplishments are. But it's actually, they're, they're good, because I see them as symbols of the, I, I was able to accomplish that based on the support that I've had from whether it be coaches, um, you know, my um, former student athletes, swimmers that were with me, um, my, you know, family, friends, whoever, my support system, because without them, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do, accomplish what I did accomplish. And so those medals represent to me that accomplishment and it there they have earned those medals as much as i have it's funny because you talked earlier about well it's a team sport but it's an individual sport and and it is it's that individual sport but yet the team is helping you helping to you know to, to nourish you so that you can go on and benefit the team as best and it doesn't stop when you leave 55 medals where do you have those medals? Do you, I mean, because people talk about a tra trophy case, like your first games is a career for a really good athlete. And we're going to talk about eventually about you getting inducted into the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee Hall of Fame. Where do you put 55 of them? Um, well, you know, actually I do have, I, I had uh, some in a, in a case, you know, like one or from each games, but as uh, right now, um, a majority of my medals are at the Olympic Paralympic uh, Museum in Colorado Springs um, for um, a display that they have for um, the Paralympics. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because you guys always do. I mean, I think Mark Spitz seemed like he made that photo famous, you know, with the seven gold medals back in uh, in 1972. If you put all 50, have you had all 55 around your neck? I mean, could you support it? <laughs> I have not, and it would be pretty heavy. <laughs> the medals do change from games to games, and some are heavier than others. But what's the what was the statement that you saw? You did seven games. What, what do you feel like you made as a statement or, or a contribution to the Paralympics and the evolution of the games? I think the statement that I would hope that people, you know, that resonated with them is that, you know, I, I swam because I love the sport. And again, it wasn't the medals. It was wanting to reach out or make an impact, um, you know, on one person or two people that may have some type of a physical disability or a challenge that they're able, they were able to see me and able to overcome those obstacles. Um, you know, growing up, you know, ADA and, you know, that was almost unheard of. And so having to constantly um, over, um, kind of being overachiever and to um, overcome those obstacles and break down those barriers um, to make the path for those who have come behind me. Um, you know, and that's what kind of the statement that I hope that has resonated with others, um, Paralympic athletes is that, you know, a lot of the stuff that they have opportunities now were based on what we, not just me, but other great Paralympic athletes have done in the past. Yeah, they get to stand on the shoulder. I mean, it's the way it works, right? Generationally, we stand on the shoulders of those who went before us. And, and we hope to continue to improve upon what they have done. Competition-wise, you look at, and I know there's an emotional component of this as well, but you say that that a bronze medal that you won in 2004 in the backstroke in your event 
is, is is the one that is sort of nearest and dearest to your heart. Why, why is that? Um, I think it because one um, in Athens, I knew that was going to be my last games. Um, you know, your body just tells you, <laughs> um, you, you, you know, it's time. Um, and also, um, it was a games that, you know, had a lot of challenges um, coming up to the games. Um, training wise, um, I had a lot of shoulder issues, um, you know, from injuries. Uh, and also, um, my, my mom had passed away um, the, the uh, June, a couple months before the games. And she had always been to every games before. So um, it was it was an emotional time um, just knowing that, you know, to be able to be there at that time and with all those different variables um, that that medal had most um, the different memories um, built into it than any other um, gold medal had ever done. Did you really have to work for that one too? Was the was it really that the competition was ramping up? It was. It was. I mean, comp uh, obviously, every Paralympic Games over my seven Paralympic Games had gotten better each year. You know, unfortunately, you know, you always have those. Um, you know, the 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 questionables. You know, just like you know, drug scandals and stuff like that. That you know, pop up and, you know, there was some issues with that, with that. And um, unfortunately, you know, you just go in there and you just figure you have to go in and do the best you can. And, uh, and that's what I did. So, um, and that's why I think that knowing that what I had to do in order to prepare for those games and knowing that, you know, I was, you know, swimming clean and, um, you know, everything was kind of going on all cylinders um, that for me that that was what I was going to, you know, be able to if I could medal in that in that event, because I was only going to be swimming at that time. I only swam, I believe it was four events, individual events. Um, and so that was the one event that I knew that I had a shot at possibly, you know, meddling. And so um, I was pretty focused on that one event. How much does the competition, it sounds like you are, it sounds like you, you can stick in your own lane, that it's a matter of how you swim your particular time. Like you, you, are you setting your expectations based on a time? Are you setting your expectations based on an effort level? Are you based on, is it based on the color of the metal? I don't, I never really, I never had an expectation or a goal um, to say, I'm going to, you know, during these games, I want to win, you know, all my events, or I want to win seven gold medals. I have never stated that. Um, it, I just feel that there's so many different variables that can happen uh, within a games that, you know, you don't, you can't be, you can't predict. Um, you, the one thing that I can predict or have control over is knowing how I prepared for the games and what, you know, was going leading up to those games. And be, that being said is, if I, if I know that I prepared to the best of my ability at that time, based on what the challenges that I may have faced, such as, you know, the passing of my mom or my injuries, shoulder surgeries and stuff like that. And I knew that, okay, I'm going to try, if I can medal and I can get on the podium, then that'd be an awesome thing to be able to do. So, um, and that, that's why I think that one medal was, you know, pretty significant and has, you know, the most impact on me. And you do, you put in all of your work. I've heard swimmers talk about this, though, that you put in all of your work and then you do your shave and your taper mm -hmm. 
And, and sometimes you really surprise yourself too. Were you still able to surprise yourself in, in terms of how much you bounced back, how much you, you benefited from that shave and taper? Yes, I think, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, based on, you know, you get that feeling. Yeah, sometimes, you know, you get that taper from a swimmer standpoint and you, you know, you key into it and it just, it's works and it's great. Sometimes, it, you know, there'll be times that you don't get it, you know, it just, for some reason you can work hard as hard as you had in the past. And for some reason, you just didn't lock into that taper for some reason. It just didn't work for you. So, um, you know, the, it just, it just all the stars have to align. And, you know, that's when you have that great feel of, um, you know, you feel great in the water. It was, you know, what it felt easy. You felt good. You felt smooth. Um, compared to those times when, you know, you feel heavy in the water, you don't feel as it was a struggle to do. So, um, you know, going into my last games in Athens, um, it was, it was hard. Um, I don't believe that I had the, the taper that I would have liked, but it get, got me through. After you've complete, competed in this huge career, how much does the public part of it factor in? So on January 1st of January or of 2005, you were one of eight athletes honored at the New Year's celebration in Times Square. I mean, yes. which is crazy place, right? So yeah. let me just let me just say who these other athletes were. So Ian Thorpe, uh, the Thorpedo, right, from Australia. Uh, Nadia Comaneci, you know, I mean, what bunch of perfect tens? She was pretty. Good. Uh, George Webb of of, of Luberia. I mean, the, uh, Francoise Membengo, Etone of Cameroon, Gao Min of China, Felix Sanchez of the Dominican Republic, Bart Connor of the United States. Like, how many people? I mean, there are tens of thousands of people in Times Square. You're with all of these athletes. What is it like to be with all of these athletes to have everybody looking at you? Yeah, you know, it sometimes it, you know, I just feel to me, I'm just a normal person. I don't, you know, so I when I look at, you know, you look up to other athletes and you know, sometimes when you're at the games, you know, you, you don't have the time to go and, you know, meet or see or look, you know, or whatever to these other athletes so you know in that instance you know when I was able to meet Bard and Nadia and you know the other athletes it was um pretty it was very surreal especially being like you said in New York City and being able to you know you see that iconic you know dropping of the ball and being able to do that process um and also be able to um, close the New York Stock Exchange. Um, being able to do that type of stuff, it was, you know, it's kind of like you're doing an out of body experience, if that makes sense, because, you know, I just see myself as, you know, a normal person going through a normal day, but you're doing, un, you know, unusual things such as those two events. So, which were, I was very honored to be a part of. Do you ever as a little kid have those kinds of dreams of like, oh, I want to do that. Dick Clark is dropping the ball in, in Times Square. That's, I want to be there. Yeah, I know. You, you know, I, I always thought that would be pretty cool to do. Um, but, you know, when I got the call to, to do it, I'm like, wow, this is, this is really going to happen. You know, so it was very cool. And um, again, I was very grateful for the opportunity and, um, for for that memory to be able to be a part of that. What was the reaction from your family? I mean, I guess I'm talking about Times Square, but also let's just talk about Times Square for right now. What was the reaction from your family? What did they say? Um, they were actually pretty excited for me, you know, because 
they had always watched it too. And, you know, they had a lot of questions and wanted to know exactly how the process was and, you know, how, what it was like. And so it was, they were very excited about having me be able to be a part of that opportunity. Were any of them there? Um, one of them was, yes. Talking about out of body kind of experiences, was it an out of body experience when you were inducted into the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee Hall of Fame? I mean, with, you know, Michael Phelps was there. I don't know if he was jealous that you had 27 more medals than he did or not. But did you did you talk to him about that? I did not talk to him about that. No. I am. I, I, I you know, I always have been inspired by, you know, Michael and you know, what his accomplishments were, um, you know, and seeing his career from when he was, you know, a young athlete to when he retired. Um, and I've always, you know, you know, I followed his career and I've, you know, I watched him compete. And uh, I, I just think what he had accomplished in the sport of swimming in general is um, pretty dang amazing. You know, I don't know Michael well, but I think he would have said the same thing about you. I think it would have been equally flattering. What was it like, though? Because, I mean, you had those iconic people. I mean, you had Michael, who was getting inducted with you. You had Lindsey Vaughn. You had Mia Hamm. You had, I mean, you had the, the women's relay from 1976, right, that you were talking about the issue of doping and they were up against the East Germans, but beat the East Germans. And so what was it like in sharing with, with some Paralympic athletes, with the hockey team from 2002, with Dave Kiley, with Muffy Davis? I mean, all these trailblazing athletes. What, did, what, what, what goes through your mind when you're there with everybody and then they call your name up? Yeah, it's... Uh pretty uh like i said it's it's almost like an out of body experience like you're watching it but then you're not thinking that it's really happening until it you know you you look back on it um you know going going in when i got when i first got the notice that i was going to be inducted into the hall of fame with this particular class i was like i was awestruck at first because i was like whoa you know these people like you just listed off and it was like you know i've always looked at them and watched them compete and you know thinking what you know they've accomplished in their particular you know disciplines of sports and um how amazing athletes they were not just you know on the field to play but off the field to play and you know for me to be a part of that and be one of them inclusively within the um, class of 2022 um, it was you know I had to do a lot of reflections and you know and and see if you know to, in my mind to you know um, just believe that you know I should be in that class were there some serious discussions with yourself like yes I believe I, I deserve to belong here what are you thinking I'm just some I'm just some, some girl from Southern California like uh, yeah I just I think that you know you see other athletes but like me I I see myself like I told you I just see myself as a normal person as an athlete who when I went out, did my thing, I swam and I, I just allowed my, my sport, my swimming to, you know, speak for me and for what I accomplished. And I, yes, I may have been, you know, a, a athlete with a physical disability, but, um, you know, I overcame a lot of, you know, uh, barriers and challenges and, um, but I, I didn't, I wasn't very boastful, um, you know, I'm pretty, pretty laid back and pretty humbled when it comes to my accomplishments, because I don't, I think my swimming and my accomplishments, whether it be written down or, you know, uh, displayed within, a, you know, a video, uh, I think that represents, you know, who I am. And um, if I can, you know, so when I went and 
you know, I was able to finally meet some of these people, uh, you know, like Lindsay and, you know, um, I had met Michael um, before, um, but also like Michelle Kwan and Mia Hamm and, and I, of course, I know Muffy and everything, but um, when I was able to finally meet, you know, they're just normal people like me so um that's if that makes sense it was so it was kind of it's kind of hard to describe normal people who have done extraordinary things which to me is is why we get into sport right that that it really is a normal person who does something that is truly extraordinary i mean you went from 1980 to 92 without winning without losing a race uh 25 races in the paralympics what do you what's the message? I mean, you said your kids are grown now. Yes. But as they were as they were growing up, what was the message that you gave them from the experience that you had as an athlete, from the work that you did, from the success that you had? I think the biggest message is um, you know, dream what you want to dream and um do what you want to do, whether it be in sports or whether it was in um, education. Um, but don't ever let anybody stop you or tell you you can't do it. Um, you know, not, both of them, they weren't swimmers. Um, they, you know, one was, you know, they both played soccer. One was, you know, played soccer for a little bit, but she didn't like it. And then she went into diving. So, um, but that was their, um, you know, that was their passion. And um, whatever their passion was, that's what, you know, I and, you know, my husband supported and um, we believe that, you know, to be your own advocate. And that was really important that we pushed, um, you know, nobody's going to, you know, do things for you, but you're going to have to do it for yourself. And did you really enforce the or reinforce the, the work part of it? It seemed like that was such a big part for you, not necessarily the outcome, but you put the work in to be prepared. Absolutely. Yeah. And we actually um, really did, um, you know, emphasize that, put the work in early um, for your long-term goals. And that whether it be, like I said, whether it be in sports or whether it been in their education, um, you know, make sure that you put the time in and the, and the work in because, you know, nothing is going to be given to you. Um, and that's just not, you know, how um, I or, you know, our mindset is, you know, you have to be dedicated um, and you have to be fierce of what you truly believe in. And that's, you know, kind of what we've always stated to them. It makes a lot of sense. What do the kids take? I mean, kids, I'm calling them kids now. They're, they're grownups, right? Yeah, yeah. What do they take from your career? I mean, are, are, do they do they share it with you or do you hear it like in the backseat of the car kind of thing or or something like that? You know, do you hear them whispering to their friends kind of thing? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I don't um, I don't see we don't talk about my career as much when things come up, you know, they'll say you know, they'll tell, you know, their friends or they'll say, oh, you know, that's so-and-so, but they won't, they don't, um, we don't really talk about it because to me, that's just a chapter of my life that was, you know, has been passed, um, you know, and we focus more on, you know, right now, the today and in the future, what, you know, what's important. And that was a, just a part of me, you know, and my husband was a swimmer as well. And so he knows, he, he, he sees me for who I am as a person and what, not my medals and, you know, what I've accomplished, but who I am now. So, um, and the person who I've become as an adult. So you, did, you, you didn't hear your kids growing up bragging about their mom? um yeah once in a while but I would kind of put it you know like I said I was very low-keyed I would say you know it's you know I didn't really talk about it a lot um just 
I just didn't feel that it was, you know, necessary. I, I, that was just me personally. Um, but, um, I, you know, they would, you know, if they do a paper, you know, for school or, you know, whatever they need, some, they did it at times. We'll get you out on this one. Which was kind of weird at times. <laughs> I would imagine, well, they, it's probably relatively easy research because you know it all. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to interview mom and then write my paper. It makes it a, a paper to write. Do you feel any different after the Hall of Fame induction? Um, it's kind of like, I think um, it feels still kind of surreal to know that, you know, this, that I've been enshrined, so to speak, into the museum and, you know, in this class and, you know, my name is, is going to be a legacy, you know, for, for infinity and yeah, they can't take it away from you. Right. <laughs> and so um, to, to know that and, you know, for people to be able to see that, I mean, and again, it's, I've always been, if I can impact somebody, um, you know, it, whether it be one person, one, a hundred people, a thousand people, it doesn't matter. But as if I can, in, in, you know, just get in a little niche of somebody who may be having, you know, some type of difficulties and finally can realize that, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel and that there is opportunities out there. But, you know, you, you have to take those opportunities and move forward with them. Well, I think you've impacted a lot of people. You've impacted a sport. You've impacted a movement. And, and you've stretched people. You've made people work a whole lot harder to, to catch up to you. And, and, and interesting that you were humble enough to also, toward the end of your career, be willing to, to chase people. Yes. And, and there's something to be said for that as an athlete. You're not just a front runner. Uh, it's, it, it's tremendous. I mean, Trisha, thank you so much for sharing your story, sharing your time. Uh, I am still blown away it, with 55 medals. I mean, I, I won 13. I feel like that's, it's, it's like, it's, I mean, that's just like a game and a half for you or something like that. That's so. okay, Chris. You did an awesome job as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. But thank you so much for joining us and for for living with with such uh, such humble strength. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you to all of you. We really appreciate you joining us. We hope that you've enjoyed it. The greatest gift you can give us is to tell your friends, tell your friends to tune in. This will be a traditional podcast. So when that comes out, if you'd like us, if you'd follow us, if you'd tell your friends, we will continue to come back with great guests and we will hope to entertain you. Thanks very much. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Yeah.